Father, we are grateful, we are thankful um, for your great grace and your great love for us. Um, what great love. Um, and that heaven opened up its doors and opened up the floodgates to shower us with your loving kindness, with your grace, with your forgiveness, with the strength that we need for each day, uh, for the renewal that we discover each new morning, Father, that it's a new day, it's a new dawn. Your loving kindness is new and fresh every morning. And so, Father, we are grateful. Pray that as we gather here this morning, Father, that we will sense your presence in a very profound and real way. And that, Father, it will take us out into this world and we would be difference makers for you in small ways and large, Father, and use our frailties in those moments where we are, are feeble in our faith. And use those moments even for your glory and um, to somehow shine the light into the life of another human being, Father. We live in a world that's hurting. We live in a world that's desperate. We live in a world that's lonely. And Father, may we be that sense of glimpse, glimpse of heaven, um, Father, amongst each other as we need it as well and then into the world in which we live, Father. We, we are here to love you and I pray to be loved on by you. And so we are grateful for that, Father. May your word, may your word echo in our hearts here this morning, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, most of you know that I have a passion for uh, the game of football. And most of you know that my favorite team through the years has been the Green Bay Packers. Ever since I was a young, young child, I grew up watching such greats as Bart Starr, Paul Horning, and Fuzzy Zeller. Fuzzy, if you don't know, was a lineman because you had to be a big lineman with a name like Fuzzy. In the 60s, however... The Green Bay Packers were the team of all teams. Championship galore. But it wasn't always that way. It never is in professional sports. Really, it never is in any sport. There was a time when Green Bay wasn't a great team. They weren't a good team. Matter of fact, they were a lousy team. The fact was, they were awful. They had talent, but they could not win a game. Then they brought in this new coach, rough character, brutally blunt. He got in the faces of everyone. Didn't matter who you were, you got it. It's said that Vince Lombardi is one of the greatest coaches to ever coach in the history of the NFL. And in a few years, he turned a lousy team and one of the greatest to ever play the game. Many ask the question, how was he able to do something so amazing so quickly? Well, the secret to his success was that Vince Lombardi knew how to keep things simple. Very, very simple. Vince Lombardi always began with the basics the fundamentals of the game. The very first practice, he grabbed a ball and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. Comes down to the basics. At the end of the day, this is all we have. Gentlemen, this is a football. And then Vince Lombardi began to build the Green Bay Packers from the foundations up. This morning, I want us to go back to the foundations, back to the basics. We're entering into a season of ministry where the focus is going to be upon, upon building. We're not looking at building a new church home, building a new worship center, building a new youth center, building new classrooms and offices, at least not yet. 
But with a new year and a new name, we're looking to build upon a renewed sense, really a new sense of vision. And with a new vision comes new ministries, and with that comes a new direction and new opportunities. And how we build matters, and how we build ultimately affects how effective we will be. It all comes down to how we build and going back to the basics and building upon the very best of foundations. And so I want us to slow down and take a good look at our construction site. This morning I'm going to provide the big overview and kind of the main idea, and over the next several weeks we're going to dial in and we're going to take it apart and we're going to look at the details and we're going to look at the depth that we need to discover. But I want us to slow down and I want us to look at the construction site. Not the one made out of brick and mortar, but the construction site that is Stonebridge. How will we build this ministry so that it stands the test of time? How will we lay the foundations? And we think they've already been laid, but we'll discover we can drift. But how do we lay the foundations so that this ministry will impact lives for the years to come? How will we make a difference in this community once the cement, so to speak, has hardened? Well, I want us to see that the answer is quite simple. If this ministry is going to make a difference in this community, if this ministry is going to impact lives, if this ministry is going to impact the generations to come, the generations to follow, if this ministry is going to make a dent for the kingdom of heaven and for the kingdom of God, if this ministry is going to have any effect whatsoever for the things of eternity, then God, God must be, must be the builder of of it all. If we're going to make any difference in any capacity at all, then God and God alone has to be the builder of it all. To let that settle into our souls here today, I want us to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want us to read verses 1 through 11. We're going to become familiar with this passage over the days ahead. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I got to love that, by the way. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you're not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not yet able, for you're still fleshly. For since there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, and are you not mere men? What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants from whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
the Apostle Paul knew one thing for certain when it comes to ministry. If you want to build a ministry that lasts, if you want to build a ministry that affects people's lives for the whole of eternity, if you want to build a ministry that impacts this world for the cause of Jesus Christ, then God must be the builder of the whole thing. In fact, Paul's theological treatment of the building process is summed up in Psalm 127, verse 1. Solomon writes, Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. Now Solomon knew what Paul was talking about when it comes to this whole idea of building. He was privileged to watch God build a house. Solomon was privileged to build the temple. The whole nation rejoiced when it was finished. And then Solomon tried to build an empire on his own, apart from God. It's an amazing thing to watch a Lord build a church, to watch it all come together, not just in terms of brick and mortar, that's what we typically think of, but with every life the ministry touches, that's what's the delight to watch the Lord build. It's an amazing thing to watch a few people come together, form and grow into a local church. It's amazing to witness a ministry become a community with a heart to reach its very own community. It's amazing to witness the miracle that the church can be when we're at our very best. It's an amazing, amazing thing. There's nothing like it. Every life that's saved is a living miracle. And when we come together and worship God, we testify to the very miracles of God and to the great work of God in our lives. Every time we gather together, it is an amazing thing to watch. It's an amazing thing to be a part of. It's a living thing. We are a living entity that God is working, growing, building. Not brick upon brick and stone upon stone, but life upon life, soul upon soul. That's what makes us who we are. But the great danger in ministry is that we begin to think that it's our church. And rather than God working in and through us, we begin to take over the work. And then we ask God to bless the work that we do without him. Solomon knew what it was like to have a home that was void of God. He knew the frustration of building alone, of the emptiness that comes with it, of the futility. At the very end of his life, he cries out, vanity, vanity, vanity. Emptiness, emptiness, emptiness. Nothingness, nothingness, nothingness. The best, the best word in the Hebrew would actually be absurdity. Absurdity, absurdity, absurdity. When you take it all in and you evaluate it all, it doesn't make any sense this side of heaven. Therefore, the end of the book, we're called to cry out to God because we have to look to the heavens to make sense of it all. God allowed Solomon really, to burn the midnight oil trying to pursue this thing of wisdom to figure it out and try though he might. And looking at every angle with all the wisdom that he had, he couldn't figure it out. It doesn't make any sense. Why do the wicked get the spoil and, and the good get the persecution? Why? Why does a person work his whole life to, to earn all of that reward and then give it to the next generation? They blow it all. It's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. Why do good people suffer? The bad people get away with it. And over and over and over again, you see Solomon testing the field of wisdom, trying to make sense of it all. And he only comes back and says, not just emptiness and nothingness, but it's absurd. It doesn't make any sense on this plane. And so in Psalm 127, he provides the summary of Paul's words to the church at Corinth, and he simply says, unless the Lord builds the house, we labor 
in vain. And so today we have to know with absolute certainty this simple, simple truth moving forward. Here's the truth. If we're going to build anything, <clears throat> then God must be the builder of everything. If we're going to build anything, then God needs to be the builder of everything. If I had to summarize Paul's thoughts and Solomon's words into one phrase, it would be this. If God doesn't build it, then we don't want it. If God isn't building it, then we really don't want any part of it. Today they have a children's show called Bob the Builder. A typical children's cartoon about a guy named Bob who loved to build. We've got one of those in our church. It's Bill the Builder. <clears throat> we have Bob the Builder. And they sing this theme song. Can he build it? Yes, he can. Bob the Builder. So now when you walk into children's stores, it is filled with Bob the Builder stuff. You got Bob the Builder shirts, Bob the Builder hard hats, Bob the Builder tool belts. Why? Because every child knows that if you want something built, who's going to build it? Bob the Builder. Can he build it? Yes, he can. Well, if we're going to build anything, then God must be the builder of everything. Can he build it? Yes, he can. Why? Because God's the builder. If you want to build a business, then God better be the builder of your business. You want to build a marriage, then God better be the center of of your very relationship. You want to build a family. Then God better be the builder of your home. You want to build a Bible study. Then God better be the builder of your group. You want to build a youth group. Then God better be the builder of your ministry. You want to build a ministry. Then God must be the builder of everything. Our greatest mistake is thinking that we can make this a man-made endeavor. So the question for us all is, how do we ensure that God is the one building the ministry? What do we do to make sure it's not a man-made project or a man-made ministry? What do, we, what do we do? Well, here's the first thing that I think we need to do. And we need to stay on top of it at all times. We need to step to the side. Simply step to the side and let God run the show. Hardest thing for us to do, very difficult for us to do, to simply be still. Isn't that what Scripture tells us to do? And to know that He's God. To step to the side. To step to the side and let God run the show. The great paradox is that if we want to build we need to get out of the way. And if we don't want to get out of the way, then we'll only be in the way of God. Paul understood this. He wrote to a church that forgot that God was the builder. And instead, they made it a man-centered ministry. And they built it upon the efforts and the abilities of such men. Instead, Instead, they turned the church into a popularity contest. Who is the best? Who is the brightest? I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. Sure, the great men of faith. But Paul reminds them, not once but twice, they were just mere men. It's a subtle word, but a powerful word. They're not just men. They're merely men. Corinthians lost sight of the central truth, put their focus on man's abilities. And look at how Paul describes the results. They were immature in their faith. They were marked by divisions and discord. 
They were characterized by sin and every form and fashion of it. That's what happens when men build ministry apart from God. It simply falls apart. Statistics tell us the church is split when they're in the midst of a building campaign. Can you imagine that? It's the high point in the life of a church. I remember as a church plant, we met in schools, and then we finally got our building and all that, and we were, hurrah, I mean, we're finally getting there. And I watched the prayer life of the church suffer once we got in. But churches split in the middle of that kind of campaign causes us to wonder why. Why does such a great moment become such a tra tragic moment? I mean, what happens to turn that around and to turn it so ugly so quickly? Well, I can tell you why. It's really simple. People get in the way of what God wants to do. It happens over and over again. We simply get in the way of what God wants to do. The focus moves from what God is doing to what we need to get done. And the emphasis moves from this being God's house to becoming our building. And we simply forget that God is the builder and that Christ is to be center stage. Whenever God moves in a mighty way, he has his people step to the side. Moses wanted to see Israel redeemed. God put him on hold for 40 years. He said, step to the side. When God finally called Moses back, God only told him to step to the side again. Plague after plague displayed the awesome power of God to deliver his people. I don't need anyone to help me on this one. Y'all need to just step to the side. In the final display, God had the whole nation step to the side and actually lock their doors. I don't even want you to go outside. Stay inside, lock the door. No involvement whatsoever other than put a little blood on the doorposts. But you all sit tight. Sit back. Step to the side and watch what I can do. And then when God brought him out of Egypt after all of that, he brings them to the Red Sea and he tells Moses once again and the nation of Israel, one more time, step to the side. You're not going to do anything. The powerhouse of Egypt and all of their armies and all of their might barreling down their throats. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to turn. An army behind them some see in front of them. What in the world are they going to do? And God says, step to the side and watch what I can do. When the early church came together after Christ's resurrection, Christ told them, step to the side. Acts chapter 1, Christ tells them they need to go and reach the world for him. But before they're to build the church, Christ tells them, step to the side. Stay here until it's the right time till you receive the Holy Spirit, till you receive the things that you're going to need to do what I want you to do. But in the meantime, step to the side. And then, and only then, I'll set you loose for my kingdom. And we all know the rest of the story. The church rocked the world for the cause of our Lord and our Savior. And we all know how the church exploded on the scene when Christ finally said, hit the ground running. But is that really the rest of the story? Seems to me the early church had to go back to the foundations. They had to go back to the basics. I mean, the early church knew one thing and one thing only. They knew Christ and Christ crucified. I mean, they knew that. But they soon forgot the rock. And very quickly, things began to get very rocky for the church. 
It's amazing that by the time we get to Revelations, the church has lost its sight, lost its sights, and had lost sight of Christ himself. And we see Christ calling them back, calling them back to remember their first love. You started really well. Every church, all seven of them. Boy, you started really good. And you had this, and this is what set you apart. And this is what made you unique as a church. Oh, this church was doing this really well. This church was doing this really well. But one by one, what was their strength became their weakness. And one by one, he's got to call them back. Because they had forgotten They started to rely upon themselves. They started to rely upon their riches. They started to rely upon their own strengths. They started to rely upon everything and anything except our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord has to call them over and over and over again back to the basics, back to the foundations. You began well, but what happened? You forgot me. And you started to rely upon yourself. You forgot it was my church, my bride. You took things over, started to work it out on your own, and then you hit the wall. You're not even lukewarm anymore. So what do we do? Go back to the foundations once again. Much like God called the nation of Israel, we see Christ calling out to his church. I think we need to remember that this is God's ministry. It's not ours. It was never ours. We need to remember that we can do nothing without him but everything with them. And remember that if we're going to build anything, men and women, and I mean anything, then God must be the builder of everything. Well, that means we need to step aside. We need to let him build through us. But there's a second thing. Then we need to seek his face at all times and in all ways. And at all cost. How do we get there? How do we get to a place where we forget that it's his and not ours? We stop seeking him at all cost, at all times, and in all ways. We stop seeking him, and when we stop seeking him, when we stop looking to him, when we stop asking him, we step into his role. We start seeking elsewhere. We start asking other people. We start relying upon ourselves. And even the gifts that God has given us, God had given Solomon incredible, incredible wisdom. He forgot the one who gave it to him. He started relying on all that wisdom in his own strength. Taking his eyes off of the Lord, he placed them squarely on the things of this world. He fell headlong into depravity headlong into sin, testing out the spoils of this world at the expense of the riches of heaven. That is how we get there, is it not? Isn't it how we get there as individuals? We forget them. We start building our home by ourselves. And our homes are no longer Christ-centered. Our marriages are no longer Christ-centered. The two becoming one, this mystery being great. I'm not talking about the husband and the wife. I'm talking about how that is a reflection of my church and of my bride. 
the imagery becomes distorted over time because we've let it. We have a different photograph in our mind, a different picture, a different portrait. We forget marriage is a gift. And by design, it is to be a reflection of the church. Forgiveness, love, commitment, all those great and noble things go by the wayside when we take our eyes off of Him. And when we do that, it's no longer husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church who gave Himself up for her that He might nurture and cherish and sanctify. No, that's long long since past, becomes something else. It's reflected in the church. It's reflected in our homes. It's reflected in our very lives. The moment we take our eyes off of him, we place our eyes on ourselves, our eyes on something else, and we begin that perilous journey of spiritual drought and disaster time and time and time again. One of my deepest concerns, greatest concerns, is that we move ahead of God. That we don't step aside, but rather we run ahead of Him. Most churches would say the same thing. I don't know too many churches that wouldn't say the same thing. But the truth is, all of us fail here. We fail here as individuals. We fail here as the church. And far too often, we rely upon ourselves. We trust in our gifts and our abilities. We build upon our own ideas, with our own ingenuity, only to reveal our own insufficiency and our own inadequacy you would think that we would learn. But oh, how often we make the same mistakes. We see it in the history of Israel, and we wonder sometimes as the church, how could those spiritual knuckleheads do that so often? I mean, really? They had God right in front of them. I mean, my land, all of I mean, How could they possibly do that kind of thing? And you can hear it in God's voice to the nation of Israel. I've done this, I've done this, but, but you've abandoned me. You mistreat me. And we look on and we go, how could they do that? And then we come to the New Testament and we look at the early church and we scratch our heads. How could they do that? How could these churches in the book of Revelations, how could they possibly do that? And yet the writers of the Scripture remind us we're to read these stories and learn those great lessons so that we don't repeat them. And we have the luxury in our current day and age to look at churches who've gone before us, this community and around this nation and around the world, and we watch them bottom out and we go, how could they do that? How could that happen? Doesn't it make you wonder 20, 30 years from now when people look back on us? What will they say? Will they say, wow, there was a church who absolutely walked with God, listened for Him, sought Him, prayed, worshipped, We could see what it looked like when someone walks with the Spirit and not in the flesh. How we treat one another. Will they look on like that or will they look on and go, wow, what another tragic story. What another church that didn't quite get it. If we're going to let God build this ministry, if we say that, I mean, if we genuinely, genuinely say that, and who here doesn't want to say that? 
if we genuinely say it and we genuinely mean it. If we're going to let God build this ministry, then we need to seek his face. We need to find ourselves basking in his presence. Find ourselves bent, and I mean genuinely bent, before his throne. And we need to find ourselves broken, men and women broken, as we seek his holy face and broken as we see it. If we see it. If we want to see the great things of God, then we need to seek the face of God. John Piper said, prayer is the coupling of primary and secondary causes. It is the splicing of our limp wire to the lightning bolt of heaven. How astonishing it is that God wills to do his work through people. It is doubly astonishing that he ordains to fulfill his plans by being asked to do so by us. God loves to bless his people, but even more, he loves to do it in response to prayer. In Romans chapter 15, verse 30, Paul calls the church to strive together in prayer. It's a compound word in the Greek. Soon agon. I'm going to try it here, folks. <laughs> it's a tricky one. Sunagonizomai. I had it down yesterday. Comes from two words. Soon, together with. Think of synergy. Soon, together with. And agon. Now that's a word that I've used before. Run the race, agon, run the race of agony. That's the word that's used there. It's combined here with together with. And so together with and to agonize is the concept here. Combined they mean to agonize together, to strive or to strain in prayer together with. It's a powerful word, if you can pronounce it. It's a strong word. We strive. And we don't like that kind of imagery, do we? Sounds like too much work. Even worse, to strain. Even worse, to agonize. To agonize. I think we have moments of that. When we come together and we start to pray over a loved one who might be dying of cancer. See, that's how we get there. We get close to that moment in time where we're agonizing. We are praying. We are beating the gates of heaven and the throne room of heaven. Lord, please, a miracle. Lord, please, another day. We get it in those moments, don't we? Our children are struggling. We get together for those moments and we agonize together. See, it's worth it then. And we strive and we strain. God, please, please, please. And friends come alongside. We're not even immediate family, but we're the family of God. And because of that, we too, Lord, please, please, I'm begging you. Oh, we'll strain, we'll strive, we'll agonize when it's life or death. Isn't eternity life or death when it comes to the soul? Begs the question to me, to you. When's the last time we were bent over and bowed over and we agonized together? We strained for the salvation of a soul. When's the last time we got together and we agonized and we strived together 
that God would add lost souls into this place and we'd see him come to faith in Jesus Christ. When's the last time? If we're strained as a ministry, it's not because of that. If we're strained in ministry and striving, it's because we've been doing it without them. That's true of every church, men and women. If we're straining in life and in ministry, we can almost take it to the bank. We're doing it without them. Would we seek his face at all times and in all ways? The critical question is, will we strive together? And so here's how we can band together, how we can pray together. We can pray for souls, pray for laborers for the harvest, pray for unity in the body, Pray for maturity in the body. To come together and pray together for the leadership of the church, for the officers of the church. Pray for gifted individuals to fill the ministry spots that we need. We're quick to plug them. Are you breathing? Are you alive? Would you be willing? Done. Another problem solved. Not once seeking the face of God to do it. I got an idea. I have a thought. We haven't sought the will of God or the face of God. It's just habits. It's just patterns. It's just discipline. And how we're disciplined. Pray for our hearts to be humble. Pray that we get out of the way. How's that for a prayer request? That we get out of the way. And we pray that we allow God to build his house. Now, those things should ring real familiar. They're the very things I asked us to pray about as a focus group together two years ago. I handed out cards to guide us along the way. I said, just give me one. One is enough. It's not an indictment. It's not heavy pressure. It's a reminder, and it's, it's, it's a maybe a visual for us to understand how how easy it is to say, how difficult it is to do. I may not get a lot accomplished here in my lifetime as a pastor. There's a couple things I would really love to see. I'd love to see this church praying like I've never seen before in my entire life. I've seen ministries that do that. Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, I've seen it. Some of you have seen churches that have that. We're not there yet, but I sure hope we can get there. Is it going to stretch us? You betcha. But how many here want to see the great things of God? How many? How many are willing to do what it takes to see it? Yeah. They come up a little harder, don't they? (laughs) I'm not doing that to lay anything on anyone. i got to look in the mirror too, folks. I'm the pastor. You know how many pastors fall into this rut and think they can do it because they can speak? You know how easy that is to do? i got to fight that every Sunday. 
every Sunday. If we're going to build anything, if we're going to have any sense of what God wants to do with this ministry, not in our lifetime. It'd be so easy to go, let's finish it out. You big, big hoot, hoot, hoot and holler. Works really well for me. What are we going to leave here 15 years out that is going to stand the test of time for others to come along and see that God had done a great work? It is not about us, folks. It is and will always be about his kingdom. And if we ever have any other agenda than his kingdom, then we have the wrong agenda. So my role is to beg me and to beg us to get back to where we need to be. God first. Always first. Christ center stage at all cost. All cost. That's what we'll build upon. That's what he will build upon if we will simply get out of the way and seek his face. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Oh, you can go ahead and try it the other way around. See how far that gets you. I got 10 to 15 years left in my life and in this ministry. I promise you, I'll give you every breath I got. But, but, this is how we will do it. And as hard as a shock as this is for anybody, if you're not all in, there are a lot of churches out there that can welcome you. And that includes me. I just want to make a difference in the time that I have. But it's got to be his way. And men and women, I will. I will. I'll die on that hill. Let's pray. Father, please be exalted. Please be honored. And please be praised. We worship you in Christ's name. Amen.